On a video I dropped recently, I explained how I use parallel compression to get the most out of any signal. And this is the same reason why everybody who uses it uses it. Because the idea is you keep a clean signal and then you can distort or saturate or compress like crazy, all the other options, but the clean signal remains. That remains getting to the mix bus. Now, somebody asked, or a few people actually asked, do you do this on all the instruments or just drums or what do you, how do you use, like what don't you do it on, what do you do it on? So this, what this comes from understanding in my opinion is when you listen to a sound, okay, like for on vocals, why do I use a de on the track itself? And then why do I send that de signal into the parallels? Well, the reason there is because I don't want to send a lot of something that I then have to get rid of in all these parallel channels. Like, why would you want to get rid of something six times, four times, three times when you could get rid of it once? So if the D, if the S's are bad, you handle those on the channel so that when they get out to everything else, you no longer got to handle them. This is the same concept of why you would put EQ before reverb and not after it. You know, I had a student in a lesson and when I saw the session, I said, why are you putting the EQ after? He's like, because I'm supposed to EQ my reverbs. I'm like, whoa, it doesn't make more sense. Consider that it might to put the reverb, I'm sorry, the EQ before the reverb, because then the reverb can do what it's going to do in a more natural way without you then having to take away this you know, sound that has become, if you, if it's super wet, very obliterated by reverb, for example, to try to take away something that is now expanded into a lot more frequencies that are splashy and all this stuff is a lot harder than if it was never there to start with. So by cutting out certain frequencies before the reverb works, it's going to work better. Just like by taking out the S's before the parallel compression works on it, it's going to sound better than to try to remove the S's on each channel after you've sent them off to all this parallel stuff. It would, and, and depending on the amount you change on how much you're taking out after each compressor, which is all going to work differently depending on that compressor and how it, you know, how you have the ratio set and how the attack and release is set. Why would you want to deal with everything separately? It's a nightmare. It's a mishmash. This is the same concept. Why I EQ the vocals before I send it to the parallel compressors, because I want the good vocal sound to get to the parallel channels and then have the parallel channels just be able to do their magic. Andrew Sheps has mentioned he doesn't usually parallel EQ. I don't usually parallel EQ for this reason. The EQ gets worked before it gets there and that would always sound more natural and better in my opinion than EQing on the parallel channels because you will also be in a situation where you'll have to be very aware and in tune with the idea of your, what your EQ is doing to really know if it's helping or hurting. Whereas the other way, if you don't parallel EQ, you never have to think about it. So it's the wild west. I never want to say anything's right or wrong because we all love J Jack Joseph Puig. And JJP mentions all the time that like the guys that would go into his studio and say, you're doing that wrong, you're doing this wrong. That, that he always looked at that as like, what? Get out of here with that. It doesn't, there's, there's no right or wrong. It's about what you're trying to achieve. So I never want you to think that when I say I don't typically do something that you shouldn't. I just want you to understand what I typically do. And I'm honest with you about what I typically do. If you want to go outside the box, try your own thing, feel free. And I encourage it because that's how you'll understand what you like and don't like and either come to the same conclusion or a different one. So by all means, parallel EQ if you want, but the reason I don't is because I'm handling that before those parallel channels take over. Because when you smush things, you're bringing up everything about that signal usually. And if it's something bad is getting into the signal before you're bringing it all up, you're now bringing up all the bad stuff too. So just understanding that, I'm gonna translate this to bass. People have said, it was a question in there about like, do you do the same thing with bass? Because bass, you know, this clean signal may be too hard to manage, you know, too much transients, too spiky, whatever. And let me explain. You're absolutely correct because, and the answer is yes, I do parallel compressed bass is in a similar way as I do drums, but just like I do with the EQ and with the DSing on vocals, 
before it gets there so that I don't have to handle that on each channel I'm parallel compressing after it gets there. It's the same thing with bass. I might shave down the transient on that signal itself just so I'm getting different flavors out of the parallel compression with the smush signal or the saturated signal or something with a chorus effect or something blended in. But what I'm also doing is not getting a version that's unusable. So for example, on bass, a lot of times my th their clean channel gets the bass sound just with the transient shaved down enough to be able to make it blend well. Now, usually that happens by putting on some sort of compressor with a fast attack because when people think, you know, slow the attack down to, to make things more punchy and stuff, that's true, but that bass transient that comes out with, you know, especially when it's being finger picked or anything like that is super pokey. And that's why if you were to compress with a slow attack, the attack basically, like the compressor doesn't start working until after that transient happens, which is why you get this very sort of Un, not a thick, warm signal throughout that's consistent. You get this signal that's like super loud and then quiet. And that's not what a good bass sounds like. A good bass is really that like nice blossomed sound. And that comes from making the attack fast enough where it's going to grab the transient and sort of make it relatively level with the track so that it's you'll hear it, but... It will also make everything feel very uniform. And a lot of times on bass, I'll also sort of slow down the release um, in a way where when it's super fast, it's going to let the back taper off a lot. Whereas when it's a fast release, it will be more consistent and even. So what I'm trying to achieve with bass is that even you know, constant bass sound throughout. I don't want anything to be hitting too hard. And then as a result, in comparison, everything is too quiet. So you have a hard time balancing it. You have a hard time putting it in the track in a way that's great all the time because it's either you can't hear the front or you can't hear the back. So you're shaving down transient, maybe on the track itself. Then when you parallel process, you know, on your parallel compress on one and smush it, you do another one with saturation possibly to get a lot of tape sound, you know, that'll work to your advantage. Sometimes I'll even do that tape sound thing on the track itself and then just parallel compress on the other two, like there's, you know, or three, there's no like right or wrong way. And that's what I want you to realize. I'll say this a ton of times if I have to, it's the wild west out here. Everything goes, there's no rules. If you can come up with a way that works, then it works. If it sounds great to you, then it works. Don't, don't question whether you should do or not. Just do, just do. And then listen back and come up with your own ideas of whether you like it or not, because me telling you you should or shouldn't, it might get in your way. You know, so this concept of trying is how I got where I'm, you know, relatively happy now when I make my mixes is because I had to try things throughout the way. And something I tried, this is the different ways you can parallel compress like the entire mix. Let me just give you an example, a couple, because I started out doing it one way. Now I do it another way. I used to do I used to do everything but drums on the parallel channels because when I first learned about it, I was like, why not? You know, this, the, the bass guitar is playing kind of a mid-rangey, you know, very busy part, and it's not just like drilling low end. So maybe it can live in that compressor signal with the other stuff, like with vocals, with guitar, with keyboards. Maybe it can live there and it'll be okay. So I would first do just my drums had their own set of parallels, and then everything else was, was sent to three channels or sometimes four that did a different process on each, but was getting the whole mix basically, except for drums. And that worked okay, I didn't hate it, but then I started to yearn for more control. There was a mix or two I did where I was just not happy with how gluey things actually were, how much the compressor was like working on the entire mix. What it did that was a benefit in that situation was when I would make those parallel channels louder, now the whole mix got significantly louder and I could very much decide how saturated I wanted this whole mix like how much of everything do I want like blasting at me or how little depend because it would remove the dy not dynamic range as I would make those faders louder and I was like oh this is a great way to control volume but 
it, it was too gluey, some songs, too much. So I was like, let me take bass out and see if that gives me what I want, but in a better way. So I took bass out of that signal and the bass had its own set of two or three parallel channels. So the bass was being sent to those things. And sometimes, like I said, before I got it sent there, just like with DSing on vocals and stuff, I would take the transient off the front so that it was relatively level. I'd use a compressor to do that. Sometimes I'd use a compressor and a tape saturator to do that so that it got sent to these parallel compressors that were all giving me different flavors, but it was being like, you know, a way that I wouldn't have to remove stuff later that was already gonna be in the way on all these parallel channels on bass, the two or the three, right? And at that time, when it was drums on its own parallel, bass on its own parallel, and everything else, vocals, keyboards, guitars, on its own set of parallels. That sounded really good where I still use that to this day more often if I had to pick percentages on when I typically or when I don't typically. That's the most typical solution for me most of the time because I have the most control of it. But what I also like doing, and I've mentioned this in another video, is break out a wide bus parallel. And my wide bus parallel just has anything, like a, a, a widener going on where it's really mid side focused. And that's where I'll put things that I want to get out around my ears really wide like maybe it could be a set of uh like ambient guitars or it could be background vocals or ad libs or something like that and i'll send those to that super wide parallel channel and that will exist next to a channel that's not wide giving me some extra width all right so like my point is there's like no right or wrong i use whichever i need to at the time you know and another option i've done is just send vocals to a bunch of parallels, send guitars to their own like parallel, you know, and that wide thing, let's say, and then bass on its own parallels and drums on its own parallels. So in that case, everything gets its own set of parallels. That's what I mean by there's not a right way, there's not a wrong way. You could do it in all through all your instruments or you could put everything together just like I was explaining with like everything and bass or everything without bass. There's really no right way to do this. It's about you hearing what you like and moving from there. So concept wise, you should be thinking, what do I want to take out of this signal so that that's not blown out of proportion on every other parallel channel? And that's when you think like that, you're using it as a tool in the proper way to be able to get either a clean sound and a distorted or dis or compressed or saturated next to it, blend it in with the right amount to taste of each of those faders, or you're getting a clean sound minus, you know, the things that you don't want there anyway, and then able to, to process the same things I just described separately right next to it. You're using it in a way that makes sense with this concept. Do you want a super clean sound or do you want it to be tailored in some way so that it's better suited for all the parallel channels that are going to get it because that's what's happening you know if you're sending stuff like i explained it's not always you want a totally clean sound like i said even on vocals i want it de-essed and i want it eq'd before it gets to those parallel channels because that'll just give me a better result through all the parallel channels so it makes no sense for me to not do the de-essing and not do the eqing before i send to the parallel channels because then if I were to EQ each parallel channel at that point, they're all sort of, they might be fighting each other. Like if you give some one more mid-range than another or one less than another, depending on the way the attack and release works, they could wind up fighting each other. So they're, like I said, no right way, no wrong way, but every time you move EQ and manipulate stuff around, you're basically creating a situation where now one channel sounds very different than the other, and I don't usually like those fighting each other. So I had a student recently to have a, a song with a bunch of pianos, and pianos are really, you know, a hard instrument to manage because they span such a wide amount of octaves, right? So if you've got a piano playing a lot of low instruments, I mean, a lot of low, you know, melodies and things like that around the, the bass section of the piano i had this particular student used like a couple different piano sounds like different samples from different pianos and blended and had them together doing a lot of, they were all doing the same like low end part but it was different you know or, or, or something kind of similar on a low end but it was all different piano sounds and it occurred to me i was like i don't know if that's the right move and mostly because 
there's so much overtones. There was also reverb built into these sounds, and and it was very muddy the mix that I was that. Once I pinpointed that, I was like, that might not be the best idea because that piano is doing so much in terms of how much it's space it's taking up in the frequency spectrum on one of them, and now you have two of them that both sound different. So they're basically like pianos EQ differently, and they're all taking up all this space, and it's constantly changing at different times. And it was a way to really get yourself in a corner where. You know, how much do you expect to be able to live clearly when you have reverb on a t a two pianos that sound totally different? You know, two concert hall style pianos playing stuff in the low end with tons of overtones on top of each other. And it wasn't like one's pan left and one's pan right or any. They were just down the center and it was really, you know, blended with cellos and other things down the center. And it was just really started to get into a place where I'm like, that's probably not the best idea. Let's hear how it sounds without that and then determine if we like that better. Because sometimes, you know, you'd think you're helping by like doubling apart, for example, but only if it works. It's only helping if it works and you have to be able to hear it and determine if it works. And if you're wondering why your mix doesn't sound good, look to these things. Look to the low end instruments that are maybe stepping on each other and decide what should live where. So in that particular case, we wound up using both pianos, but like rolling off low end on one and letting the low end breathe on the other and rolling off the mids and stuff on, on the other so that one could sort of dominate the low end and one could dominate the mid range. And then it started to make a little more sense. But concept wise, I want you to understand why I did that because you can't allow things that have these multiple frequencies all pushing and pulling in different times in the same register you know with with reverb on them which made it even worse all trying different reverbs mind you because it was built into the sample it wasn't like just on ascend so we couldn't control it you know so it just makes it really hard to deal with when you're dealing with stuff like that so it's a, it's a similar thing if you're doing EQ on an instrument and you're pushing one different than another, they may wind up fighting each other a little bit. So just keep this stuff in mind. No right or wrong way. You can absolutely do anything you want. You just have to know what you are like listening to and decide if you like that. And if you don't, then consider that what you did wasn't the right move and maybe change something or let one live and roll off the rest. This is how you'll develop the ideas. But if you don't have the concept of why to use the tool, then you won't know how to, you won't ever know when to use it. So in my opinion, knowing when to use parallel compression about you want a clean and then you want the rest or you want a clean with something taken out that was hurting us and then you want the rest. That's the concept. So there's no need to go further on this. I think we all get, the, you know, hopefully everyone's under on the same page here. And if not, throw it in the comments. I'm happy to answer your questions. We got the difference makers will come through, help out as well. I really appreciate everybody's replies and responses. Subscribe if you dug it. You know, if you haven't already, I appreciate that too. My name's Evan Jaffe, Custom Cut Studios. You guys got this.